All right. Welcome to episode 81 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Jonathan Berman. He's a renal physiologist, science educator, and a science advocate. He served as national co-chair of the 2017 March for Science, and his new book is called Anti-Vaxxers, How to Challenge a Misinformed Movement. Welcome, John. Hi. <laughs> and so, John, to begin, can you tell us a little bit about your academic background and what sparked your interest? Or I guess what got you started sort of in examining or exploring the anti-vaccine movement? movement. Um, so my academic background is human physiology. Um, and specifically, uh, I study ion channels from the kidney that are sort of involved with regulating the reabsorption of sodium. So they are partially in control of how you deal with extra salt you take in in your diet, and that alters your blood pressure because the way water moves depends on the amount of salt. Um, so that has very little to do with vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, as you mentioned, I was one of the co-chairs of the March for Science, and one of the one of the surprising things to me was that when I was encountering people who um, who were seeing themselves as science advocates um, and who were you know trying to push their way of doing things on the March for Science. Um, there were a lot of people who very much saw themselves as pro-science, but they had anti-vaccine views. And to me, that kind of represented a paradox because in, in my view at the, the time, these are incompatible ideas. You, if you're pro-science, then you're pro-vaccine because the science has said vaccines are safe and effective. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to understand that, and when I was um, I, when I was working at the March for Science, I had proposed uh, that we do a book of pictures of people who had marched, and then like kind of like a, a Humans of New York type book. Mm -hmm. um, and then I handed that off to someone, and then I left the organization, and that book actually came out without me. Um, but I, I had still had the contact at MIT Press. So I said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in doing this book. Um, so I, I sort of spent two years writing it, and it came out um, coincidentally mid-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of strange to get the criticism, well, this doesn't include anything about COVID. Um, because well, I wasn't planning on, on there being a global pandemic. Right. I'm just thinking this will be a small academic book. Mm -hmm. Well, out of curiosity, what do you think uh, started the anti-vaxxer movement? Uh, is this something? Is this like a modern day era thing, or is this something that um, has been going on for many years and um, we're, we're just not aware? I think that because you can look and see there were anti-vaxxers in in the 19th century and in the 18th century um immediately following the first vaccination there were people who said this doesn't seem like a good idea right and the arguments they were making uh, back then are almost identical to the arguments people make now mm -hmm. And what that tells me is that uh, because the technology we use to make a vaccine then has almost nothing in common with the technology we use to make a vaccine now, that they're not really objecting to, um, to any of the, what's actually in the vaccine or any of the science. Uh, what they're objecting to is, is really coming from basic human fears. Um, they have, uh, they have these um, these ideas. They have, they have fears that are coming from fear of of government having too much of a role in their lives, making medical decisions for for them. Um, fears about putting foreign things into their bodies. Um, fear of not you know 
having control over their children's lives. Um, and, and, and fears even of, of childhood illness, um, which is sort of a, a very basic fear, right? Um, parents are afraid their children will be sick or will die. And they, they see um, childhood illness back then more than we do now. And then we see it now sometimes too. And you, you want to look for something to, to blame that on. Um, so rather than, than seeing it as a, a movement with a creator and a direction and a purpose, I see it more as something that, I don't want to say organically, but something that will arise in the presence of vaccines to varying degrees, almost no matter what. So um, I was one, I know this is a very uh, rudimentary question. And I, we do assume a, an intelligent audience, but I think it would be important to describe like, what is the uh, utility of vaccines? What is a vaccine essentially? Uh, and yeah, what's its yeah. purpose? Right. right. I, I know it's very rudimentary, but it might be important to highlight that. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you say vaccine, you're talking about a lot of different technologies. Uh, okay. You can have a vaccine that is made from taking pus from a cowpox or onto like a little blade and lance it and then scratching some of it, that's a vaccine. Or you can have something like the COVID vaccine, which is made with molecular bi biology um, and some, some really cool technology. Um, and, and that's also a vaccine. And what do those two things have in common? Um, well, they're, what they share in common is we, we made an observation or scientists made an observation a long time ago that once you've had some, a disease, you're less likely to get it again in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and that's immunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's natural immunity. And so what if you could have natural immunity, you could have become immune to something without getting sick? Mm -hmm. That'd be pretty cool because then you wouldn't get it and you wouldn't be sick. So um, one of the first ways of doing that was getting someone sick, but not as bad. So that was variolation. That was taking smallpox and, and scratching someone with smallpox in a place where it tended not to cause severe infections. Mm -hmm. um, then cowpox comes along and cowpox, they didn't know it then, but it's very similar uh, virus to the smallpox virus. So some of the proteins on its outside have the same shape as the proteins on the smallpox virus. So if you make someone sick with cowpox, they don't get very sick, um, they won't die, but they'll be immune to smallpox. Mm -hmm. um, so every vaccine has this um, common mechanism of tricking your immune system into thinking that disease is there, uh, but not actually getting you sick. And then down the line, um, if you encounter that disease in, for real, you now have the immunity that almost as if you had been sick with it and gotten better. So, because right. because I one of the myths, right, is that essentially when you're in fact when you're given the vaccine that you're infected with the disease. I think isn't that one of the points of the anti-vaxxer movement of like why would we want to infect ourselves and you know if, if we're trying to prevent this disease from happening? Yeah. So I think there's a couple things going on there. One is. If you've ever gotten a flu shot, sometimes afterwards you feel crummy for a couple of days. Right. Oh, yeah. um, and that is because the flu shot looks to your immune system like the flu to some degree. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an immune response, which is what you want and expect to the flu shot, then you'll feel crummy for a couple of days, just like you would feel crummy if you had the flu. Right. Now, it will never be as severe. Um, and that means it's working, but you haven't actually been injected with the flu and you're not actually sick in the sense, you do not actually have an infection. Um, so that's one part of it. And the other part is that one of the technologies for making a vaccine, or two related technologies, one is a dead, or uh, I, I say dead, and scientists will roast me for that because the viruses are not alive in the way most people strictly define life. Um, but a killed virus, inactivated virus, um, is can be one kind of vaccine because if you 
take virus and concentrate it and treat it with formaldehyde, and you cross-link all these proteins, you, you kind of force them to be um, stuck together kind of like glue. Um, they, now they're no longer able to infect you, but um, they look enough like themselves to the immune system that they can create. Immune. So that's one way of making a vaccine. Um, and then there are attenuated uh, viruses. So that would be something like uh, the way um, one of the first chickenpox vaccines was made um, by taking the virus and putting it into a cell line from another species and passaging it multiple times to the point where it's really good at infecting guinea pig cells, but not so good at infecting human cells anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an attenuated virus vaccine. So that, so the combination of those things, I think, you know, if you're not paying attention to how things actually work in a lot of detail, can look like, oh, you're 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 getting the real disease. Um, why would I be injecting with COVID? Well, no one no one's going to do that to me. Right. Right, and some people probably take on the the opinion of, oh, well, if I haven't been sick yet, why would I want to take the vaccine and then feel like crap for however many days? Some people make the um, their immunity argument or say, uh, well, I've been uh, exercising, I've been taking vitamin D, zinc, quercetin, you name it, I'm forgetting the list of you know what you should be taking. Mm -hmm. And then some people are saying, well, uh, I don't need the vaccine. Um, I have my immunity. Uh, what would you say to somebody like that? Yeah, I, I had a roommate in grad school who was kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, he, he said, well, I, I never get sick. Um, and so I don't, I don't need the flu shot. And well, you think, like, like I just said, this, this, the, the symptoms of, of diseases are caused a lot of the time by your immune response to them, right? Um, it's caused by your immune system recognizing that disease and you have an inflammatory response and a fever and so forth. So if you're not getting sick, it doesn't mean you're not getting infections. It means you're not noticing them. Um, so the, you know, there's nothing special about your immune system that's, that's making you immune to all disease. Um, you, you may have you know, a somewhat weaker immune system. Um, and on, on top of that, the immune system is kind of in this delicate balance between um, overreaction, so autoimmune diseases and allergies, mm. and underreaction, which is what happens with um, acquired autoimmune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, where you become vulnerable to uh, opportunistic infections, so pneumonia and cancers and, and so forth that you wouldn't normally be susceptible to. Um, so between that balance, um, there is some range, but there isn't a lot of range that can be um, where you're, you know, you're gonna double your ability to fight off COVID through taking vitamin D or, or vitamin C or whatever. Um, and the way the immune system works, you have a part of your immune system that's sort of very good at, at general threats and you have a a part of your immune system that's very good at identifying specific things and then preventing and stopping those infections. And what, what we really want to do is get that specific immune system to, to be able to fight off coronavirus because um, the more general abilities of the immune system are not sufficient. Um, so the other part of that is that you know, again, if you have you have this myth that the immune system is this gradient of of not working very well to a boosted immune system that's super immune or whatever. Um, the 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 people who are dying and having severe effects of, of COVID, it doesn't seem to be clearly linked to any of the measurable um, factors in the immune system. Um, there are people with normal cell counts and, and normally functioning immune systems who are developing severe reactions. Um, and, and so you, know, you, can, you can be healthy and you can be exercised and that does um, reduce your chances of 
of having severe illness. So it reduces your chances of diabetes, which is a complicating factor, it reduces your chances of hypertension, right. um, can reduce your um, risk of having poor lung capacity. Um, there, there are all these benefits to being well and, and being a healthy person, um, but they're not gonna protect you from coronavirus necessarily. Yeah. So I've heard uh, recently, and I, this may be misinformation because uh, especially these days, depending where you're getting your news, you may be getting really false information. But um, one of the things that I've heard is that even if you get the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, um, it may still be transmissible. Uh, you may still be able to transmit the disease. Does it at least uh, lower um, the ability to transmit it? Um, is that why, is that the utility of as many people getting vaccinated as possible? So, so what, so there's, there's a couple different questions in there. Right. So let's un unpack those, right? So the first is, do we know that, um, that these vaccines are able to prevent you from spreading it to others? And that's not a question they asked in the study. Mm -hmm. The study was, is this safe? Um, and does it prevent severe illness? And does it prevent illness at all? So uh, in the, the population who were, was vaccinated, you can go and, and look at the paper um, compared to the control group. They track almost one for one the number of sick people or the number of people developing COVID over time for the first 14 days or so. And then the control group continues to go up and the other group levels off. Um, almost immediately. So there's like an inflection point. Um, mm. And those people probably got sick before they were vaccinated um, and they just didn't start showing symptoms for two weeks. Um, and, or they were probably infected um, because there's, there's a, a, a sort of a, a two-ish week incubation time um, before you start to show symptoms. Okay. Um, and then among the people who got the vaccine, so now um, we had a few hundred people who got sick and I think a handful um, from that first two weeks mostly in the vaccinated group, no one had severe illness. Now, why there's a question is because there have been sort of varying reports depending on how you interpret data that there are a lot of people who have asymptomatic coronavirus. Um, so, so like I said, you might be sick and you might not even know it because your immune response is not as strong or it's not specifically to, to coronavirus. So you get sick, you don't even notice it. Uh, and so those people, um, because they don't notice it and don't to get tested, we don't have the data to say that there weren't as asymptomatic carriers uh, who got the vaccine. Right. Now, there's, there's good reason to think that you wouldn't have as many asymptomatic carriers in the vaccinated group because there's no biological reason to think that if you're immune to it, you would still be an asymptomatic character. But because it wasn't tested for, you can't say that definitively. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the second part of what you said, I'm trying to remember what where I was going. Oh, um, so the second part was... Um, so if it's less uh, transmissible due to obtaining the vaccine, does, is, that, is that the necessity for everyone to get uh, vaccinated? Because some people okay. may argue like they're healthy and all this, they might not need it, they're young, et cetera. Right, so the, the, this is where the idea of herd immunity comes in. Okay. Um, one of the features of vaccines is that they work better when more people have them. Mm -hmm. um, so I got my first dose two weeks ago. Um, the, in a couple weeks, I'll get my, or a week-ish, I'll get my, my second dose. Mm -hmm. And then I can do whatever I want, right? I can go to sweaty dance parties and breathe on people. <laughs> and fun. Well, no, because um, it's not a perfect protection. And I could still, in theory, you know, be an asymptomatic carrier and spread it to other people. Um, but, you know, if enough people had it, then no one could get it because um, say that say this was 95% effective and you have a population of a thousand people and everyone gets um, vaccinated. 
and then one person comes along who has it. What is the chances that the first person they run into is able to be infected? Five percent. Right. Um, okay. Well, what if there is an a long shot and the, the the first person they run into isn't able to? Um, then that person is walking around encountering people. Um, how many people are they going to encounter if they can infect? Well, the first is five percent. So instead of being very high odds of spreading it to someone you've now decreased those odds very low and the virus can't mathematically spread to enough people to keep that infection going. Right. Um, eventually it gets to someone who doesn't happen to encounter another uh, vulnerable person um, and then it, it just runs its course and then it's gone. Uh, so you can imagine though, well, what if 90% of the population is vaccinated? So now there's 100 people around who are 100 plus 5% of 1,000. So uh, what is that, 50? So there's 150 people around who are vulnerable. Um, and now your odds of encountering one of those people have gone up a little bit, right? Right. Um, so when you work out the mathematics, it works out to you want about 70% about of the population vaccinated. And then it, at that point, you've reached the critical threshold reached a point where uh, the population has enough immunity that if there is an outbreak, it can't spread. So that's why um, getting vaccinated isn't just about yourself, it's about protecting other people. Because right. it means you now can't become an asymptomatic carrier, it means you can't become sick and then spread it to other people. Right. And it's like the, the myth kind of on, um, on the other side seems to be that, well, if enough people get vaccinated, then I don't have to do it. Because let's say if I have a community of, I don't know, you know hypothetically like 10 people, and let's say, uh, let's say I'm one of the 10 and the other nine get vaccinated, it's okay, right? Sort of, I don't, well, I mean, let's say this is just in simplistic terms. Um, so, but the idea is it's like, oh, well, if I just kind of remain in this cocoon, which obviously doesn't happen because we're in a bigger world than that, where it's the likelihood of it spreading is it's kind of minimal, right? Or kind of null maybe in their minds. So the idea then is that there's no, unless I guess is the notion then that it's probably best that obviously everybody in that community get vaccinated because even if let's say, I don't know, 90% of them get vaccinated, it still wouldn't necessarily be good enough. So the idea is you want as many people who, as can to be vaccinated because there are some people who are immune compromised sure. can't be vaccinated, right? Um, there might be some people who have some allergy to something in it who can't be vaccinated. Um, with the flu vaccine, there's an egg allergy that, that some people have and makes it hard for them to get the flu shot. Um, so what you're doing if you're saying that is, is you're being selfish. Mm -hmm. um, you can say, well, it doesn't matter if I pay taxes, someone is going to pay taxes and then roads will get built. Uh, it doesn't matter if I signal when I change lanes because other people will and then I'll be safe. Right. Um, and a lot of people make that, that calculation. Um, although I think the, the downsides of getting vaccinated are, are so few to none that you really have to, to, to balance these, these risks, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are the odds that I get infected? You're right now pretty high. What are the odds that if I get infected, I get sick or make someone else sick who dies? Okay, so that's on one side. On the other side, put, well, what are the odds if I get vaccinated, I'll have an adverse reaction? Right. Um, very, very low. Um, so, so you're you're balancing risks. You're balancing um, you're balancing you know the your your own personal interests versus collective interests, um, and then you're making a decision. Now, my argument is that the collective interest and individual interests are ultimately aligned, um, but you know people are very reluctant to to be told what their individual interests are. Right. So you, you know you live in America, right? So you've you've seen um, people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's there's a very there's a very strong um, individualist character to American life, 
it makes it, it makes it very difficult to, to convince people um, to do things that help other people. I think it's also just, uh, not just, but I think it's uh, misinformation that gets people to not want to, you know, acquiesce, you know, to, to getting a vaccine. Like, for example, um, I heard somebody say this recently, and please, I, I hope you correct this. Uh, so somebody said, um, if you already have antibodies, like you've had um, COVID before, but then you get the vaccine while still having the antibodies, the vaccine is not as uh, effective. Maybe there's no point in getting the vaccine. Somebody said something like that to me recently. Um, well, so again, when you get sick, it usually confers some degree of immunity to you. Um, and there's different degrees of, of time that the different vaccines, the different illnesses confer immunity. So there isn't that I have seen a lot of evidence of people getting sick with COVID twice. Um, there have been a few cases, uh, but it doesn't seem like something that's that's, that's really that common. Mm -hmm. um, so I, if you've had it, it's possible that you know that you have sufficient immunity, but the way that the tests have been designed is to study immunity over long periods of time and, and to see when it when the immune response is sufficient that we can be confident that you have long-term immunity. That's kind of like the idea of a booster shot. Right. Um, some vaccines, the initial immune response is not very strong, but then the second time it's much stronger. Interesting. Um, and that's kind of why we have the two dose, uh, two dose uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, mm -hmm is this is designed to, to create a strong immune response. Um, so there's a, there's a possibility that if you've had it, um, a, a vaccine would be beneficial to you in terms of immunity. Um, I kind of understand where they're coming from um, and they're, they're stating it with a, with a lot of force um, and a lot of certainty that I don't have. So even if I had had it, um, I would still want to be vaccinated just for the, the extra protection. Right. And then, so I think one uh, going into the actual anti-vaccine movement, I mean, it seems like one of the most, or I guess it's multiple factors, but just to kind of chalk it up to one, it seems like the thing kind of behind it, outside of obviously the emotional aspect is sort of the distorted way of kind of seeing data, seeing the world, interpreting it. So like, you know, the example that I just mentioned before about how we're, this sort of idea is, well, you know, if nine people in my little community are vaccinated and I'm the one who isn't, I'll obviously be protected. So in a way that's kind of distorted because nobody lives in a vacuum, right? It's not like, you know, here are these people who are only going to be in contact with one another and they're not really factoring in kind of the 95%, you know, success rate. So what? Also, how many people would think what you're thinking? Like, oh, well, I don't have to get vaccinated. Somebody else will. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, how can we account for how many people think like that? Yes, yes, yeah, exactly right. true. But my thinking is there in the little community, right? So let's say you, I don't know, again, like let's say it's a family, right? And you're thinking, oh, well, I only see my family, right? Which is very black and white because it's not true. You don't only see your family. You go out of the house, you go to the grocery store. It's not true, right? But the thinking is, well, I'm only in touch with my family. And then let's say four members are going to get vaccinated and I'll be just the only one who isn't. But then you're not accounting for obviously the members of your family who see other people, that you see other people, you know, whatever. So so, but the idea there is that when we think of it, um, when we think of like vaccines and when we think of science, a lot of times, sort of there are these distortions behind them. So John, can you speak a little bit about what you found in your kind of understanding or in your exploration of the anti-vax movement? Like what sort of distorted thinking patterns are involved? Yeah, so I, I think we all just had a very visceral reminder of how dangerous misinformation can be right. with the, the insurrection in DC. Um, where people have sort of been fed misinformation about voting and they, they took it to heart. And they, they thought that the election was being stolen from them. Right. And their remedy to that was to try and murder the vice president, speaker of the house and various members of Congress. And they failed, but it's, it's sort of shocking they made it as far as they did. So misinformation is in, and conspiracy thinking are, are very powerful um, things. Um, so one of the, the things I wanted to understand with the book was 
how do you go from being someone who's just sort of skeptical? Maybe you have some questions. Um, you know, you've heard some people say negative things like, well, I don't know, I've, I heard that can make you infertile or whatever. Um, how do you go from that to being the person running a, a Facebook group spreading vaccine, anti-vaccine misinformation? Or how do you go from that to being someone making documentaries about it or, or, or doing really in, intense things? Um, there was someone in, in California who threw a cup of menstrual blood onto a lawmaker who was, who was working on the vaccine law. Um, wow. So one of the, the things that I think is important is something called escalation of commitment. Mm -hmm. um, so when someone is a part of a group, um, their commitment to that group can, can sort of be ratcheted um, with increasing intensity over time. So part of that is, uh, is group polarization. Um, so groups over time tend to shed less extreme members. Uh, it's, it's like if you, if you join a club and if you join, I don't know, a golf club and you're playing golf with your buddies and then one day someone says, you know, we should just burn down our rival club. Um, if you're, you know, kind of, you like golf, but you're not at the murder level of liking golf, you're gonna probably say, yeah, no, that's not for me. But if you're really into golf, that, that brings you in, right? You participate in this act and now, and now they have you, right? So mm. as opinions are shared that are more, extreme um, people tend to leave groups who are more moderate in thinking. Uh, and the other part of that being that groups reward people for certain lines of thought. And you see that all the time on, on Twitter. Um, I love to pick on Twitter. Um, so you, people signal all the time their in-group status, um, what groups they're in. Um, and they do that with things like the kinds of language they use, um, the ideas they share with each other. And so um, to get those, to get Twitter likes means you're getting recognition from your group. You're doing something people enjoy. You're, you're, you're being rewarded for um, sharing certain opinions and that's going to ratchet up your um, interest in those opinions and this, the extreme uh, extremeness of, of those opinions. Um, so that is one part of it, I think. I think another part of it is that humans are just very into being parts of groups. Uh, um, people will you know, stay very devoted to groups. Uh, people will, excuse me, mm -hmm. will continue with decisions they've made well past the point when logic says um, you shouldn't do that. Um, so it's sort of the gambler's fallacy, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, I've put $10 into this, this, this pot, I'm going to bet another dollar because I can't lose that $10. Then right. you lose that, 10, that $11 and you say, oh, okay. I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm down 11, I gotta, I gotta stay in until I'm up by 11. Another, by 11. All right, right. Or not by one. So you put in another 10 and then you lose it and then you put another 10 in. Well, it's got to hit eventually, right? Well, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't. Um, it, we're, we're, we are wired to think it, we will, but we won't. Um, so we're, we're sort of wired to make excuses um, even after ideas have, have proved to be, to be wrong. Um, other fact, so there, there, there are other factors as well. Um, I don't know the degree to you, which you guys pay attention to logical fallacies and, and cognitive biases. But. Yeah, yeah. So uh, backwards rationalization, for instance, or cognitive dissonance. Yeah, the ad hoc. Like to, yeah, to feel good about your emotionally motivated actions, you'll invent reasons after the fact to justify those. Um, actions. Yeah. Right? And, and I would say a great deal of what we cover on our show is we try as best as we can to particularly find guests that help us see like where this sort of kind of misinformation and where, um, I guess, especially from Alan's perspective, where sort of the kind of cognitive battles, so like where they come from, right? And how people are unable to see each other's perspectives and what are the sort of fallacies involved in the kind of their stubborn thinking. So yeah, I would say that's a great deal of what we do here. Yeah. So 
all of those cognitive biases apply here too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so I'm sure you, you've talked about the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes, yeah, so we had a whole episode on that, yep. Yeah, so I think people usually get that wrong um, where they say, well, the people who are the, who are the most ignorant think they're the, the most expert, um, which is not what the paper initially said because mm -hmm. uh, the paper, the data was people estimate themselves greater than they should be, but still less than the experts. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a degree of Dunning-Kruger effect. You don't know what you're not an expert in. Um, I think there's a tendency among anti-vaxxers to attribute malice to people. Um, so there's, there's um, the inability, there's the ability we have to introspect and think, why did I do something? But we can't introspect into someone else's mind. That would be telepathy. And that, that's not something we can do. There's right. nothing you can do. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when we see other people taking a bad action, we tend to to think of that as a as a fundamental uh, piece of their character. Um, so if we see someone else shoplifting, it's because they're a bad person and a thief and a criminal. And if we're hungry and we need to steal food to survive, it's a one-time thing. We had to, we'll pay them back when we get money. Um, mm -hmm. So that, you know, that's a fundamental attribution error where we tend to, to be less generous with other people's motivations than our own. Um, yeah, so there's there's kind of a lot going on in mentally, I think, that that makes us more able to accept these kinds of, of anti-vaccine views compared to compared to you know the non-existent perfect to totally perfect rational view of things. Yeah. Uh, yeah and uh, for example, um I don't know, uh, another piece of information that's been touted around is uh, Bill Gates uh, wants to make a monopoly on uh, vaccines. He wants to microchip you. The mRNA uh, um, uh, proteins will change your DNA forever. Uh, you shouldn't, you know, like a lot of certain ideas are getting pushed around. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how much momentum they have and how many people buy into them. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, but so I'm open whenever somebody comes at me with those kinds of ideas, I won't attack them for having those ideas. I'll of course, try to have a back and forth with them. And if, if possible, I don't want to like, con, you know, condemn them because then you just become the other to them and you can't uh, have a productive conversation. Mm -hmm. But I, it's hard to say like somebody like Bill Gates, who's a, this big philanthropic figure who's done a lot of good you find one or two pieces of information like vaccine things went wrong in uh, India. Yeah. I don't have all the information, but like people will harp on certain little facts and then kind of, um, what is it called? Inflate them. Right. And it also, John, do you find that like for a lot of these people that there's a mistrust or I guess I would say probably a, yeah, so a mistrust, but like a widespread mistrust of like, so I guess people in power and maybe just people in positions of status where they think like, even though the kind of efforts perceived or seemingly are philanthropic and they're seemingly benign or, you know, kind of generous that they're actually not, that there's some kind of nefarious uh, scheme behind them. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that underlies a lot of conspiracy thinking we, you know, should we trust the people in power? Well, I don't know. Um, the, the FDA designs processes for testing things. And we can look at those processes or I can look at those processes and say, okay, I think this is a good process. I trust this. Um, so I, I'm willing to be vaccinated. I think it's harder if you don't have the science background because you're being asked to at some point you're being asked to trust someone right so it, it, that is a really hard ask uh, for people um and I, I i think part of how we we get over that hump is by not doing science communication the way we traditionally have done science communication where I show up in my lab coat and 
I say hi, I'm, I'm John Berman, the, the science Berman. Um, and I, I tell you what's true. And I'm say, well, look, I'm wearing a lab coat. I know everything. Here's the science, believe it or else. Um, I think that model um, is, is, is suited to maybe, you know, a science class in, in school, but we, we have to be better about being people as scientists and sort of being open to having conversations with people and, and saying, well, you know, I've, I've looked at the science, here's what I think, you know, I'm your neighbor, I live across the street from you and, you know, we can discuss it. Um, and I think if we did that better, uh, we would we would do better at, at building that trust. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, there, there are, you know, any, all kinds of institutions have trust issues. Um, people will, will mistrust corporations, they'll mistrust government organizations, they'll mistrust um, not-for-profits. Um, underlying all of that is that conspiracy mindset that, you know, I don't know what's going on, but something is going on. Right. Um, you know, I think if that person came across another conspiracy theory that didn't say it was Bill Gates, that said it was George Soros, or it said it was, um, I don't know. Warren Buffett or whoever. Warren Buffett, whoever. They would believe that then. And you say, well, it can't be Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. It's one or the other, right? And they would say, well, it doesn't matter. It matters what the, the, the official story isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's very rewarding uh, way of thinking, especially if you haven't yourself been very rewarded by, um, by, by you know, your academic life or your work life um, to, to be able to say, well, these experts you know, with their fancy degrees or whatever, they're wrong, right? Um, and I know something they don't and they're not gonna talk to me like they talk to me in school um, saying, you know, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, you look at the, the people who um, stormed the Capitol, um, again, they're, they're people who um, seem to have been, you know, a lot of wealthy people there um, who, you know, were winners in society. They were state representatives, they were CEOs, um, and nonetheless, they felt disenfranchised, um, like they were being talked down to. Um, so that, that feeling um, that experts and that the governments and so forth are talking down to people, I think has been very exploited by, by people who want to convince people of things that aren't necessarily true. Right. And how, how, how in particular does Dunning-Kruger apply here? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I think that a lot of conspiracy thinking is, is sort of a manifestation of that. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the, the example I'll, I'll give, I had a, I interviewed a flat earther at one point. Um, and he was, he was very insistent that NASA was lying to him. And what, what brought him the most glee was the idea that his science teachers in high school and middle school were lying to him. Um, so he had a chip on his shoulder that these authority figures were wrong and he knew something they didn't. Um, so, I think you can Dunning-Kruger yourself into thinking you know something that other people don't, or to, you, to, to thinking you're, you're good at something that other people aren't, or you're knowledgeable about a topic that other people aren't. Right. But you also need, the, you also need that, that level of, of resentment, I think, mm -hmm. uh, of the people who you think you're better than um, to, to really go down the rabbit hole. 
Yeah, and I'm sorry, just kind of going back to what you initially said, what was the distinction between the common understanding of Dunning-Kruger and the misconception of it, or I guess the real version of it? The way, the way people, I, I always hear it is Dunning-Kruger being people will, um, the dumbest people think they know the most, right. or the least competent people think they're the most competent. Um, and that's not true. Uh, what Dunning and Kruger did was they had these different tasks where they had um, people who were good at those tasks and people who weren't as good as those tasks. And they had them rate themselves for their, um, how, how good do you think you are at this? Um, and so the experts, um, they might say, well, I'm a 90 at doing this. And they might be roughly a 90 at doing it. So they have an accurate estimation of their own ability. Right. The non-experts might think, what well, might say, well, I'm a 60 at doing this. Mm -hmm. and the reality is they're a 40. Gotcha. So they're not saying I'm a 100 at doing this and the experts are 90. They're saying I'm a lot better at doing this than I actually am. Right. The non so their ability to estimate their own ability is, is lower. Um, possibly for a few different reasons. You know, if you're a non-expert at something, you don't have an expert around to show you how bad you are at it. Mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to learn how to weld. Mm -hmm. and I think as soon as I get a good weld, <laughs> I mean, it's so great I know how to weld now. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no actual master welder around to say, well, point out all the problems, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of kind of one of those kind of one of the, the ways it comes about is. Uh, I think um, not having accurate ways to compare yourself um, to experts. Hmm. And what do you think someone without a scientific background can sort of do to, I don't know, help themselves validate, let's say, for example, what's in the vaccine? Like a lot of people have that fear, like, I don't actually know what's in there. I'm just trusting this authority figure or this particular company, Pfizer, Moderna, you name it. Um, what could somebody who's a layman do to at least inspect the ingredients or something like that? Because I try to put myself in in their place and try to see like, what, what would I do if I wanted to disseminate misinformation for myself, even though not a lot of people comment it that way, they mm -hmm. usually buy into their existing beliefs. But Right. And, Hypothetically, and just to add on to that. So I think it's the other extreme too. So on the one hand, it's that it's, oh, well, I don't know what's in it. So I don't want to take it. And on the other hand, it's, oh, I know exactly what's in it. It's full of mercury or whatever. So I'm definitely not going to take it. Yeah. Um, I would tell them to read the incidents, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, what they'll tell uh, people who aren't anti-vaxxers. So for the for these vaccines, the new, the new coronavirus vaccines with the mRNA technology, um, the, what's in them is actually pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's water, salt, sugar, mRNA, and um, a lipid to help it cross membranes. Um, so it's, it's actually pretty simple. Um, the, the, the ingredients are listed. Um, you can look on the Pfizer website or the Materna website. And, and find that information. Um, now, can you build your own molecular biology lab and confirm that's what's in a sample of vaccine? Potentially, um, that's a possible thing to do. That'll be um, a great is the moment episode. We build our own biology lab here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but you're not going to do that, right? Um, so th there there is still an element of of trust that the the various government bodies that regulate these things have looked at it um the scientists have looked at it that uh the companies have looked at it and then had it confirmed by all of these different groups independent scientists government bodies independent government bodies and the companies um and then that's and ultimately that's what i'm doing too um as a scientist uh, i i I can go to the, the, the data and look at it, uh, but um, that's something you can do too. Uh, I'm ultimately saying, well, a lot of lines of evidence suggest that this is true, and a lot of lines of evidence indicate that this is safe, and it is what it says it is, and it works. Right. 
Right. And, and if it goes through so many different levels of vetting, right, all these different organizations, different companies, different scientists, and there seem to be a consensus saying, this is something that is uh, uh, safe, this is, you know, 90% effective, 95% effective, depending, you know, or th this one is 70% effective, whichever vaccine we're talking about. You can trust these authorities, because it's not like everyone could be in on it, right? All those conspiracy thinkers who think something along those lines. I mean, conspiracies have happened. Um, yeah, I don't want to say I don't want to say there's no such thing as conspiracies. Um, Watergate was a conspiracy, right? right. right. Um, and and so, you know, acknowledging that, uh, there, and also acknowledging there have been a couple of historical times where vaccines came out that later on turned out to have a problem. Right. Um, I think there is very good reason to think that that these ones are, are safe, um, and that the balance of risks, balance, by far, says we should all seek out vaccination when it's available to us. Right. Right. And I guess going back into sort of, I, I get what is at least, I mean, not even to me, I think, I guess that's the point of the book. What's the most important part of the book, it seems is like, how do we sort of begin to challenge these people, right? How do we be not even necessarily probably not even challenge, but how do we begin to sort of like talk to them and kind of, you know, engage in dialogue with them? So what would you suggest in terms of, let's say, you know, you meet somebody who is one of these conspiracy type people, right? And sort of they are pretty aggressive and they say, well, no, you know, even though these, you know, organizations have kind of, um, let's say, even though they've worked as checks on one another, it's still not enough because I know what I know. And I know that they're all in cahoots. Um, how do you, I guess, begin to talk to someone like that? Yeah, so I think the, the most important thing to keep in mind is that people like that, you're probably not going to change their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, where you can have the most influence is people who are on the fence, people who are, maybe have questions or um, they, they wanted to know, you know, how, how safe is this? Who do I talk to? Whatever. Um, those people, you can kind of stop them before they go all the way down the rabbit hole, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can help them find good sources of information and be a good friend to them and help answer their questions um, and, and don't jump down their throat and, and treat them like a rabid anti-vaxxer. Um, now, the rabid anti-vaxxer, the, the really super into vaccines are bad. It's like it's their hobby is to, is to hate vaccines. Um, you, you can't change someone else's mind for them. Um, the, the, I think part of bringing them over is going to be being a good source of information um, and being someone who creates a social environment where um, they don't feel threatened uh, for sharing their views, um, where they don't feel like you're gonna mock them or belittle them or, or stop being their friend. Um, you know, one of the, the strongest mechanisms for social control exercised by um, the anti-vaccine movement is um, shunning people who do disagree with them. Um, and you know, losing all of your friends and your your online world or whatever, um, that's a strong motivator. Um, so if you can create a, a safe environment for your friends to say, well, look, um, I'll listen to you if you decide to come back to change your mind or whatever, I'll still be your friend and we can talk about it. Um, I think that's the really powerful and helpful thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you really, I think, though, the best thing you can do, the most likely person you're to, into your encounter is the skeptical person. So just model good behavior. Um, you know, read up a little bit on it, um, form your own opinions, and and you know, be able to answer other people's questions, get vaccinated, show off that you got vaccinated. Um, you know, be a, a good community member, and I think that will help. 
Right. And what I also loved is on the episode that you did with Derek Barris, where you, we, well, we, but you guys talked about, um, so vaccines and the link to our, the purported link to autism. And you pretty much framed it as a question of, um, well, you pretty much framed it from the perspective of, let's say, you know, your regular kind of like mom, right? Who's trying to protect her child. And the idea there is like, well, why would I put something foreign in my child, right? Especially if it's at least to some, in some study, you know, we're going back to Andrew Wakefield, obviously, but in that study, you know, there's been a link to autism. So why wouldn't I want to protect my child? And I really love your perspective because the idea is not so much that they're irrational, you know, per se. I mean, yes, in the bigger picture they are. But the idea there is that it makes sense from the perspective of a mother trying to take care of her kid. It's just the problem is, right, the data rather than maybe rather than necessarily her perspective. I mean, obviously, the perspective is based on, you know, the false data. But I guess going before, like, um, before we end, because I think this is like a really important topic, going into the topic of vaccines and autism, right, which is pretty much before even the COVID vaccine, before we're even talking about like obviously the pandemic i mean that's kind of where the anti-vaccine vax movement seems to kind of have its tentacles into the notion that uh vaccines and autism are linked so in that respect right where you do have um these kind of anti-vaxxer so- soccer moms or whatever um what would you say what would you say that how do we engage i guess them in dialogue and how do we kind of how do we show them that like we understand or that we empathize with their predicament and we understand that it's not just irrationality that there's a reason why they believe what they believe yeah, um, well, well, like you you said, um, part of it is empathizing, right? Uh, the anti the anti the typical anti vax mom is someone who just wants to protect their kids, right? Um, that's a totally understandable motivation um, thing to want to do. I think that's something that people who aren't anti vaxxers want to do too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you are already you have common ground. Uh, the you know, the challenge is in interfacing in a way that's productive, um, and it, that's that's really hard to do um, because the conversation can very quickly get derailed. Right. Um, you know, one of the most common things um, anti-vaccine people will do is they'll start out the conversation with my kid is vaccine injured. And that doesn't easily beget, um, well, you're wrong uh, responses, right? Um, or you know, prove it um, responses. Um, so I think you, you benefit more from from being someone who is empathetic, and if you are in fact empathetic, I think that comes across to people um, in the way you deal with them and respond to them. Um, and then, when you do have the conversation, again, making it safe to to share and discuss, and not getting into to fights. Um, right. You know, one of the things I, I used to do that I've stopped doing is the Reddit argument and the Facebook <laughs> argument. Mm-hmm. Um, and it takes a lot of time. Um, it, it really like gets your adrenaline pumping. Um, like, oh, I'm so angry. I can't believe they said that. <laughs> um, but is it is it productive? Is it changing anyone's mind? Well, no, of course it's not. Right. Um, so... You know, if you have a family member, uh, it's a little bit different because you have to deal with them. Um, And then I think ultimately it's a matter of, look, I love you. I disagree with you about this. Here's why. Um, And, you know, if if it's coming down to someone you're you're having a child with, I think that's a challenge. Um, That's when you really have to have the discussion. Uh, When it's someone else's kid, usually usually it's none of your business right um the yeah um it's a hard hard conversation to have yeah and i mean because i think the idea is you know something that i think we all agree with that we kind of get 
I mean, not just only from the perspective of safety, obviously, but I think we get, you know, we kind of double down on our beliefs. So I think from the perspective of empathy, I mean, the way I kind of view it is, and I mean, it's not obviously just me, but the way I kind of view it is when we're thinking about like these cognitive distortions, it's at least for, Going, this is mostly from you know my work as a therapist. It's not so much obviously from the scientific platform because I'm not a scientist. But the idea is that when I usually tell people that you know it's okay, all of us engage in these kind of distortions. A lot of times people are like, "Oh wow, that's kind of interesting, right?" Because I don't now view it as me against you. You know, it's sort of like you and I are kind of combating each other. But no, the idea is that like, "Oh wow, you are you and I are very similar." That it's not that you're smarter than me. It's just like here I am, kind of potentially maybe engaged in this distortion. And so what I find to sometimes be helpful is when I tell people like, hey, you know, I overgeneralize too. So the idea is that essentially there that we have this really bad, and I'm sure John, obviously, you know, this, we have this idea that we're really, well, we don't have the idea, but it is an idea. We're really bad at sort of extrapolating sort of information and kind of, um, let's say, putting it together in the bigger picture. So it's like, we take like these small, it's, it's called the law of small numbers, where we take like these little sort of samples and we say, oh, because I see the cause and effect here, it must be generalizable. So it's like in the case of having a, a mother who, let's say maybe her child was vaccinated and then six months later, you know, it, they were diagnosed with autism. It's very easy for you to say, oh, well, one is linked to the other because they were so close to together. So I find that that maybe if you're if we're talking to them about that, and we're saying, no, it's quite possible that there actually is no cause and effect link. It seems that way, right? Because you know, the two were so close together. But if we're looking at the studies and the bigger picture, it's pretty much that you're overgeneralizing, right? Which is again, okay, because I do that too. Because we're, we're like as creatures, we're very sort of susceptible to potential or seeing cause and effect where there is none. So um, I guess if there's a question here, it would be how effective do you think it would be if we were to sort of be able to say like, hey, here are these kind of distortions. All of us are kind of prone to them, no matter how smart they are. How, how effective would you think that would be in a dialogue with like, let's say a, a mom who is an anti-vaxxer and a mom who's like, no, no, no. I know that this, my kid was vaccinated and then he or she developed autism. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's an important thing to, to share. And it, I think it, I agree. It's, it's probably better to say, well, look, I, I do this too. Um, it, it's just, it's always going to be a hard thing to come up to someone and say you're wrong. Yeah. Um, no matter how nicely you phrase it, no matter how um, empathetic you are and how close you are to them, people don't respond well being told they're wrong. Right. Uh, and I, I do agree. Um, it's saying these are universal things that every human do is true. It's saying, well, look, this is a fallacy of composition. You know, everyone tends to see individual cases as proving a generalized point. Um, on, you know, on the other hand, you're still telling someone they're wrong. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I in, have, have started approaching it in just the, mo the gentlest way possible and to ask the question, how do you know this? And they say, well, I know it. And they say, well, okay. I, I, I understand that you know it, but I don't know it. How how can you bring me to your um, to your level of knowledge with with the understanding that I'm not just going to accept what you're saying at face value? Um, and then I think that's maybe an entry point to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, the, the hardest part is not the is not necessarily empathizing with people or having an you know, empathetic conversation it's it's those entry points right how do we get to the point where we're honestly conversing yeah right you're you're, you're meeting them at their level so this way they they feel understood and that that's sort of the entry point and then from there hopefully once you start to bring in other bits of information they'll they might they might acquiesce to you is that sort of what it is or they might start to, to ask questions themselves um again i'm not I don't think the point of the conversation is to force my viewpoint on anyone. Mm. Um, you know, this is not a wrestling match. Mm. Um, the point is to, to say, I have this set of tools. Um, I want to give you the same set of tools so you can ask the same questions that I ask. Right. Um, I think that's a lot more powerful than trying to force everyone to believe the same thing that I believe. Yeah. Um, which would, would be a very dull world. Right. 
And I guess, so, and before we end off, one of my final questions or one of our final questions would be how hopeful do you feel about it? How hopeful do you feel about sort of, uh, let's say in particular, the anti-vax movement, but just in, I guess, in general, sort of conspiracy movements as, as they pertain to medicine in general, um, how hopeful do you feel about us kind of as a, as a kind of, as a, I don't know, a unit or as a, as just a world, I guess, sort of coming together and sort of getting a little bit closer to accepting the science. Um, well, we're never going to, I don't think we're, we'll ever live in a world without um, misinformation, without conspiracy theories. Um, there have been times when maybe we've been less susceptible or, or times when we can reach a point where society is less driven by them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this week we saw a low point um, and it could get lower. Um, if you imagine the, the, the insurrection had been successful um, and these worlds talk to each other, um, it, some, there were some prominent anti-vaxxers in that crowd. Wow. Um, the, the world I would want to see is basically um, Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. um, where everyone, you know, you, you don't see anti-vaxxers there because kind of everyone is smart and, and pretty well educated and and knows what their job is and has studied and I think that's an attainable to some degree an attainable goal um, but we have to be aware of what people's interests are and um, where a lot of the misinformation comes from um, you know there's a large and powerful supplement industry that. Yeah. That benefits from selling, um, I don't know, ginkgo and, and glutathione or whatever people think they need to take, uh, and is largely unregulated. Um, I think we just saw that about a quarter of the funding of, of some very large anti vaccine groups came from Nicola, um, it's on the order of millions of dollars. Um, so I, I think if, if someone, if journalists, and I'm not the one who's going to do it, but if a real journalist came along and started looking, you know, where, where is the money coming from? Where is it going? Then, you know, we, we, we started having dialogues about, well, do we really want these supplements to be marketed that don't do anything and people are taking them instead of medicine and are, are largely unregulated? Um, yeah, then Nobody knows what's in them. Pardon? Nobody knows what's in them. Um, well, the, the thing I think is remarkable is that when supplements get taken off the market, it's because they do something. Mm -hmm. um, it's because they have some active ingredient in them that they said they didn't or, or so forth. And so um, I think eventually we can reach a point where um, evidence-based medicine is, is practiced and people are a little bit smarter about misinformation, but it's going to be a pretty big cultural shift. Um, and it's going to take a lot of people working on that to, to kind of get there. Yeah. I think one thing that's helping that I'm noticing is that on uh, social media, I see a lot of people, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, you name it, uh, they're posting uh, pictures of their vaccination card. And then each one of them always says like, congratulations, you were vaccinated or, or some, some, something to that effect. Um, actually, I think that's pretty good um, as far as putting a sort of a, a sort of social pressure out there. Like uh, you'll see a lot of people posting the same sort of post uh, like that. And I wonder if, I mean, I don't think that's going to be the only answer. I think there are going to be a lot of factors that get people to take the vaccine. Right. But I think something like that is an interesting device. Um, and very simple, and it may help to build momentum. Yeah, yeah I think the vaccine selfies are important. Um, those are a really useful tool. They help show, you know, it's also a, a, a way of social pressuring. Um, eventually, I've seen a lot of people doing that, and that's something that's well supported by evidence. Um, and right now, we're kind of in this funny place because there aren't enough vaccines to go around. Um, but eventually we'll get to the point where everyone who wants a vaccine has had it. And is that point going to be before or after we reach a critical herd immunity threshold? Um, that's the question. Um, 
And then what I really would have wanted would be like a unified government message of safety and you know advertising campaign. It's not really going on right now. Maybe they have other things on their mind. Um, but um, yeah, we you know if we had suddenly had enough doses for everyone, you would want to be able to convince everyone to come in and get it, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Alan, final questions for John before we go, man. Yeah. Uh, if we wanted to uh, follow you, follow your work and also buy your new book, uh, where could we find it? Um, follow me. Um, I guess Twitter, I'm at Jonathan Berman with no H. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the book is on Amazon. It's on Remnant or MIT Press. And I've actually had a challenge in this informed movement. Um, if you have ethical problems with Amazon, I'm sure there's other places, Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. independent booksellers. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming Thank on, John. This was libraries. So What's that? Yeah, no, definitely the public library. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Thank you so much for coming on. This was such an insightful episode. Uh, have a have a good one. All right, man. You we'll too. be in touch soon. Take care. Bye. <laughs> All right. That was awesome. Yeah. That was very a lot cool. of information. All right, guys, if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook at Seize the Moment Podcast and on Instagram and Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Yep. Like, subscribe, hit the, hit bell. the bell. And then you can also find us at the O4L Online Network at O4L Online Network.com on top under the STM podcast section. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time. <laughs>